Tonight, we'll meet a priest who combines the liturgy with the sweet sounds of traditional jazz at the 31st Annual Texas Jazz Festival. In our checkup segment, Dr. John Kelly will tell us about the age-related disorder of osteoporosis. And stay with us for a few second thoughts on the life of a priest. On call, 24 hours a day. All this next on an exciting edition of Real to Real. Hello again, everyone. I'm Paul Perello. And I'm Pat Shelton. Welcome back to Real to Real. On tonight's program, we'll have a discussion about the new welfare reform law in New Jersey, a law that's not resting well with too many people. Father Ed Walsh from the Camden Diocese will be along to discuss what the law provides for and what's not included. Call all your priest friends and tell them to watch for our Second Thoughts feature. I think they just might enjoy it. And I suggest you get a paper and pen for our checkup feature with Dr. Kelly. It's on osteoporosis, and there's so much good information therein that I think you might want to take notes. But first, anyone who's ever heard Just a Closer Walk with Thee by Pete Fountain on clarinet can appreciate how religion can be successfully wedded with jazz music. And everyone knows that the Jesuits are known for their intellectual prowess. Well, tonight, we introduce you to a Jesuit with another talent. They call him the Jesuit Jazz Man. This is Father Frank Coco. He is also known as the Jesuit Jazz Man, but perhaps he is best known for his unique talents, a combination of being able to play the beautiful sounds of jazz music and preach the everlasting Word of God. People are uh, puzzled a little bit at first to see a Roman collar and a jazz clarinet player uh, all in one. Um, it, uh, it's a little surprising, but it doesn't take, take them long to to get used to it, and if they ask her, why are you doing this, or what's a priest doing in a place like this, I usually say, why not? Father Coco has been mastering the sound of his clarinet since he was 11 years old. At the tender age of 13, the aspiring musician was playing on a professional basis in nightclubs and dance halls throughout Helena, Arkansas. But at 17, after narrowly escaping death in an automobile accident, Father Coco had a new vision. It was a vision of life in the priesthood. He recalls selling his saxophone for a one-way ticket to the Jesuit Seminary in Grand Coteau, Louisiana. And for several years, Father Coco played only for imaginary audiences in a fantasy hall. Then in the early 60s, along came John. <laughs> I'm referring to Pope John the 23rd. And what I've done since and what we're doing today would not have happened, I think, had it not been for that good man. But I like to say he opened windows and I crawled out of one of them and got back into the music public, the jazz public. And uh, in, in about that time, I met Pete Fountain, who was one of the great jazz clarinetists. He's a Catholic, a New Orleanian, and I was teaching high school at the time in New Orleans. And I met him, and he befriended me. And I became chaplain of a social club, Pete Fountain's Mardi Gras Walking Club. Being out with the public is what Father Coco's ministry is all about. He blends his love for God with the love of traditional jazz, and nowhere were the results more evident than at the Texas Jazz Festival's Jazz Mass in Corpus Christi. Father Coco had the chance to do the two things he loves best, spread the word of God and make beautiful music with his clarinet. And it has brought people to me who might never have found their way to a priest, as a priest. Uh, they have, they're there for music but they have related to me uh, after that uh, on, a, on a basis of their faith, their religion. Father Coco says that thanks to this unique music ministry, he's been places, met people, and touched lives that he would never have been a part of if it had not been for his God-given talent of playing the clarinet. From time to time, musicians, as a result of their acquaintance with me as a player, 
have come to me as, as a priest. And I've validated a marriage on one occasion. I've uh, heard confessions on a few occasions right in a, the corner of a nightclub. Uh, and uh, it's not something that happens every time I go out and play. But it has been a kind of ongoing sideline ministry. And then though St. Ignatius Loyola had an expression, go in their door and come out yours. So I go in their door, which is jazz music, for which they've come there, and then I walk out my door, which is to help them in some way. It sounds tricky and Jesuitical, but actually it's just the way people communicate. Currently, Father Coco is involved in retreat ministry at the Montserrat Retreat House on the shores of Lake Dallas. But soon, he'll be returning to Louisiana, where he will continue his retreat ministry, and he vows to continue spreading the sweet blessing of jazz. Uh, it's a spiritual thing. Yeah. God created music. God created jazz. One interesting mass to have the pastor get up or the priest get up and, and whip out his clarinet and right in the middle of mass. I'll tell you, I'd like to see some of that here in this area. Well, anyway, what we're going to do right now is have our checkup, our medical checkup with Dr. John Kelly. And remember when you were young, mom would always say, Susan, drink your milk. Well, of course, we know you need enough calcium to uh, prevent osteoporosis. So Dr. Kelly is here to tell us that mom was right. Osteoporosis is an age-related disorder characterized by decreased bone mass and an increased susceptibility to fractures. 15 to 20 million people in the United States are currently suffering from osteoporosis and at least 1.2 million fractures, especially those of the hip, spine, and wrist, can be attributed to osteoporosis each year. Certain individuals are at an increased risk for osteoporosis. An early or surgically induced menopause is a major risk factor. Other factors which increase the risk of developing osteoporosis are long-term calcium deficiency, a sedentary lifestyle, cigarette smoking, an irregular or absent menstrual cycle, and excessive alcohol ingestion. Bone loss is almost inevitable with aging, but it appears that those who have the strongest bones in their peak years have the lowest incidence of osteoporosis later in life. Each one of us loses about a half percent of our bone every year after age 35. But women at menopause experience a dramatic increase in bone loss. They may lose up to 3% of their bone a year for a period of 6 to 10 years immediately following menopause. After this time, bone loss returns to the normal rate of a half percent per year. What can you do to prevent osteoporosis? First, exercise. Routine exercise can inhibit bone loss and may even increase the amount of bone in your spine. Impact loading activities such as walking your best and are only necessary for one hour, two times per week. Calcium. Young and old alike can benefit from increasing calcium intake. By building as much bone as possible during the younger years through calcium intake, many fractures later in life can be prevented. A premenopausal woman needs at least a thousand milligrams of calcium daily while 1500 milligrams is recommended for postmenopausal females. Estrogen. Estrogen hormone supplements prevent accelerated bone loss associated with menopause. Although beneficial, estrogen supplements are not without their side effects, the most critical being an increased risk of uterine cancer. The addition of another hormone, progesterone, to estrogen certainly lessens the cancer risk, but the combined estrogen progesterone supplement should be reserved for those with high risk for osteoporosis. As you can see, there is much that you can do to help prevent osteoporosis. For Checkup, I'm Dr. John Kelly. Thank you, doctor. That was an awful lot of good information. I hope you remembered to take some notes. Coming up is Father Al Masloff with Second Thoughts and Paul Perello and our studio guest. So I want you to stay tuned for the next half of Real to Real.
Catholic schools teach values, beginning with the ultimate value, Christ himself. This bedrock value infuses all the other values taught. It makes it easier to teach right from wrong and respect for others and individual responsibility. And those values make it easier to teach everything else. That's why Catholic school test scores continue to go up. It's why the longer a child stays in Catholic school, the better the child does on standardized tests. It's also why Catholic school students do better in every area measured, including math and science. And that's why a much higher percentage go on to college and graduate from college. And this, I think, is the reason why parents regard the decision to send their child to a Catholic school as an investment in the child, in the family, and in the community. A Catholic school education, you value the values. There is a in Salisbury, Maryland, the hungry are being fed. In Wind Falls, Indiana, a man who learned to read at 47 is making sure others learn earlier. Every day, someone in America is doing something to light up another life. But there is so much more to do. The light to do it is within us all. We only need to share it. Call the Points of Light Foundation. Do something good. Feel something real. Welcome back to Real to Real. By the close of last year's legislative session in New Jersey, lawmakers approved a series of bills said to be an informed approach to welfare. Sponsored by Democratic Assemblyman Wayne Bryan of Camden, the measures ensured education, job training, employment counseling, and child care services for welfare recipients. The legislation also denies benefits to families if a mother gives birth to a child while receiving welfare benefits. The motive behind this is believed to discourage welfare moms in New Jersey from having additional children on the assumption they do so simply to increase their welfare income. Father Edward Walsh, Coordinator of Community Affairs, Office of Community Affairs in the Diocese of Camden, joins us to first of all discuss this law which has been on the books as I said at the end of the last legislative session. Um, not too many people are happy with this law including the ACLU and the Catholic Church. Why is the church opposed to this, this new law, Father? It would seem that the church looks upon this as very destructive to the family. And as the church is family oriented, it seems to, in a way, disrupt the family in a sense that it's not going to continue the family the way we see it today in 1992. I think one of Wayne Bryant's initiatives it's not going to solve the problem of welfare in our country. Welfare reform has been going on for the last 20, 30 years since it started. And it's, it's more or less a, can be referred to, I think, as a, a way of saying, well, it's giving money away and people are never going to accept giving money away to people when they see all the negatives of welfare and how it, it's disrupting the family. But I think in Camden, New Jersey, we have uh, started an initiative with uh, Wayne Bryan is probably using some of our models. It's now referred to as the Alliance for the 21st Century. In the state of New Jersey, there are a number of counties that had the REACH program, which is a follow-up of uh, which this new program is going to be about. And in Camden County, we were very successful in getting a number of people off welfare. And the reason for that is because uh, as today in every society, we seem to do everything in one particular spot. And in Camden, we took the initiative of uh, more or less attacking the system. Uh, most welfare facilities are all uh, in one building and uh, everything is done from that one building. And that's the intake, et cetera. But with the 21st century, it's uh, more or less people who are not only the people concerned, but you have business, we have government working together. And on Admiral Wilson Boulevard, there's the old Sears building, which is now the house of the REACH program. Mm -hmm. And in doing that, it has uh, more or less become like a, something for the case managers where the welfare system would always do that. But in Camden County, we moved it out of the welfare system and put it into Camden Community College, 
where today when somebody comes in for, uh, uh, in the REACH program, they are more or less assigned to a caseworker. And that caseworker will uh, take that individual under their wing, if we may say that, and uh, they will sit down and, well, what do they need? And right in that facility, there is a daycare center where the mother can go and uh, get the necessary training at that particular time, is that what she needs? And also, uh, this is not just training in itself. I think we have to have jobs for them to be trained with. Well, that, some would say that that's a problem with, with this law, too. I mean, it's one thing to take the people off uh, of welfare, but if you don't give them something else to go to, then it, the, the bill really isn't beneficial. Well, I think that's where Wayne Bryan is, is using our model because we're working together with all the government programs. We JEPTA, uh, PIC, all of these have a, a translation which means jobs. And I think everybody is looking at what we're going to solve this problem is by jobs for people. And what happens with our particular program is that they're all working together. Let's say um, somebody from out of town wanted to come into Camden County. And uh, that person come in and he sees the facility he would like, and he says, well, I'll need so-and-so number of people to work in that particular facility. Where our REACH program would say, well, I have the people that I can line up to train them for that. And then the, the manufacturer, whatever it may be, he would say, well, that's what I'm looking for, and I need 20 people for this and 20 people for that. And in a sense, they're going to be trained for something, and there's going to be a job, and it's going to mean security, and it's going to mean the they're going to get off welfare in time. In Camden County, we have a, a number of people who get off welfare because there is a number of industries over there working with the REACH program, and it's been very successful. Would you agree then that uh, uh, on the Camden County basis as well as the state basis, this does not still middle class values then on, uh, on welfare recipients? I, I think when we use that word middle class values, I think we have to uh, look at what we define as middle class values. And I think what most middle class people look upon, it's to make a living and to have some sort of a goal to go for. And when we continuously put people on welfare and there is uh, no future for them. In Camden County, uh, within this last year, there are 200 people who are in the REACH program are now going to Camden Community College. Sometimes people say, well, education is the problem. It's not. In other words, they have to have a job and they have to have security and they have to have trust in themselves and something to achieve for. And I think just to get them educated is not the answer. It, it's, they have to have something that they're striving for, as everybody has something, a goal in life. But if they have to look at welfare for the next generation and a generation after that, we become a society where we're just dealing not with the problem. In other words, we should be dealing with what is causing all this. And most of them, is if they don't have that type of security where they can go and say, well, today I'm going to work. I'm happy to go to work. But if I have to go down to stand in the welfare line and I have to uh, every month think that's the only thing I can do, I think that's, you know, I think we're, we're looking in the right direction. And the jury is still out on the welfare law and we'll hear more about it in the weeks and months to come. So please stay with us. Much more ahead on this edition of Real to Real. Set materials for Real to Real provided by Tag Lumber Incorporated serving the Delaware Valley for over 75 years. We welcome your comments, suggestions, and donations and encourage you to write us at Real to Real, St. Charles Seminary, 1000 East Wynwood Road, Overbrook, PA, 19096, or call us during regular business hours at 668-9842. As we proceed through the Lenten season, we have a theatrical reflection through the eyes of Pontius Pilate on the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. I had no idea they'd ever bring him to me. I mean, what did I want with him? A bunch of Jews squabbling over some unorthodox rabbi, a magician, a prophet, or whatever he was. For what? I had better things to do than waste my time on his silly religious quirks. But the priests had gotten full up with him. So they came to me, livid. I had no choice. <laughs> it had to be dealt with. He really seemed quite harmless, actually likable. Yes. 
And there was something about him. His face? No. His eyes. Yes, that was it. They were meek and unassuming. And somehow he was filled with a, a dignity, an integrity, sure of himself, sure of me, as if he knew me, cared about me. I really wanted to let him go. I couldn't find a thing wrong with him unless being at peace with yourself is a crime. Three times I tried to convince the Jews to let me release him. Three times. I thought if I had him beat a bit, and that would uh, appease the Jews, satisfy their hunger, but no. People will get set on things. So I condemned him and washed my hands of it. I watched as they placed the cross beam on his shoulders. It almost crushed him. He was already half dead from the whip, and the soldiers had had their fun with him, robed him, and crowned him king. But he took the cross without a word as if he were noble or something, uh, like a lord. He walked, dragged about 20 feet and fell, hard. I thought he'd hit his head. I thought it was over then. But they wrestled him to his feet and pushed on. That was the last I ever saw of him. Poor soul. Wow. It was a powerful piece. Good acting. Which calls to mind another good actor here in the Delaware Valley. I hope you realize that this piece is done with tongue in cheek. Let's watch Night Calls with Father Al Masluck. I can't find it anywhere in this theology book here. Maybe it's in the biology book. Let me see. Must be a chapter on priests. Oh, hi there. How you doing? I'm trying to unravel one of the great mysteries of life. You see, we all know the priests are on call 24 hours a day for emergencies. That's part of the job, no problem. But somewhere it is written that priests never eat, never sleep, never have a life to themselves, and they lie awake all night waiting for the phone to ring at 3 o'clock in the morning with a stupid question on the other end of the line. Now, a priest never minds being awakened for an emergency. That's, that's part of the job. But you would not believe the night that I had the other night. <clears throat> Hello. Hello, Father. Yeah. Father. Yeah. Father Maslick? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's Father. Uh, Father, listen, uh, I want you to do me a favor. Uh, it's really okay. important to me. What can I do for you? Well, I want you to say Mass for a friend of mine. Her, her daughter's been saying terrible things about her, and she's quite upset. Uh, mm. I was just talking to her, and she's very distraught. Um. Okay. Excuse me. I, um, I think I have a free intention Sunday, so I'll say Mass for your friend, okay? What's, what's, what's her name? Joan Crawford. I'm telling you, uh, Father, all that Mommy Dearest stuff is a lie. Wait, wait a minute. Joan, Joan Crawford, your friend, you were just talking to Joan Crawford? Oh, sure. We talk all the time. Well, isn't, um, isn't Joan Crawford dead? Well, sure, Father. What's your point? No, no point, no, no point at all. I'll be happy to say Mass for, uh, for Joan Crawford on Sunday. Okay? Thank you. Thank you, Father. Okay. Good night. Phone number of the convent. Oh, yeah. You're not going to call him now, are you? Oh, no, don't be silly. The sisters are asleep. I just wanted to get the number while I was thinking of it, so I wouldn't forget in the morning. I've been lying awake here, worrying about forgetting. Let me ask you a question, honey. 
Where'd you get my number? <clears throat> oh, it's on the calendar. Oh, okay. Now, will you look about, oh, an inch and a half to the right of where my number is? What do you see there? Oh, the convent number. How silly of me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope I didn't disturb you. Yeah. Oh, no, I was just trying to sleep. Oh, good night, Father. <laughs> oh, uh, can't look at the calendar for the number. Uh. Oh, gee! Uh. Oh. Hello. Congratulations! You have just won a romantic getaway for two to East Squidunk Oh. <sighs> Oh, no. Oh. Father? Hello? Father Al, is that you? Um. Father, are the schools yeah. closed because of snow today? Lady, give me a break. It's the middle of May. Oh, I'm sorry, Father. Oh, Good yeah. night. Bye. Goodbye. Oh. Oh. I'm not going to sleep at all tonight. Hello? Hello? Ah. Hello? Good morning, Father. Yeah. When you bury a St. Joseph statue in the yard to help you sell your house, do you bury it feet first or head first? Father, are you still there? Lady, uh, can I take your number? Of course, Father. May I ask why? Well, so some morning when it's very early and you're trying to sleep, I can call you up and give you the answer. Why, thank you. I'd appreciate that. It's 668. Good morning. Since going back to sleep now. Actually, those crazy nights are few and far between, thank the Lord. But boy, when they happen, they can really wear you down. Well, you have to excuse me. I, I have an appointment to keep. For second thoughts, I'm Father Al Maslach. Hi, Doc. How you doing? No, I'm still up all night. People keep me awake. We have some serious subjects here sometimes, like the welfare issue and the plight of the Haitians. But we do like to leave you on a happy note. Father Al's mass luck, for example. Until next week, I'm Paul Perello. And I'm Pat Shelton. See you next time. Good night.